Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, another episode of Moriel TV. And we have a special, special recording here. And we're going to introduce uh, my brother Jacob Prash in just a minute. And uh, we are talking about smoke and mirrors, illusions, and delusions in the last days. Uh, I think it's a very important announcement from Jacob. It's a very important message for all of us. So let's pay close attention to what Jacob has to say. Jacob, welcome. Thank you for being with us. I'm going to turn it over to you. Smoke and mirrors in the last days. Smoke and mirrors in the last days, indeed. The relationship between illusions, as you rightly point out, and delusions. I suppose if I was to choose a background introductory song, it should be, yes, I'm the great pretender by the platters, but we won't do that. It's too secular. What we're talking about, though, is the reality of fake. The reality of fake. Two things that should be mutually exclusive, the real and the fake, are not. We live in a world where the real is treated as fake and the fake is treated as real. This goes hand in hand with the predictions of Isaiah. Good will be called evil and evil will be called good. Fake will become real. Real will become fake. For many years, we've been warning that with the evolution of technology in the field of computer video graphics, people will construct a cyber world of their own where they'll manufacture a perceived reality that will be their reality. They will live in an electronically facilitated delusion uh, through simulator technology that'll be no more complicated than putting on a pair of, of sunglasses or, or, or a visual helmet. Uh, this technology is going to get better and cheaper. It already exists for fighter pilots and things of this nature. And these things tend to turn into consumer durables eventually. And we're going to see that. People, I always wanted to be Cinderella. I always wanted to be Elvis. People will just create their own reality. The illusion and the delusion. The fake will become their reality. And what's real, they'll just treat it as fake. We see this happening all the time. Uh, these lawsuits about biological males being demanded to be treated as women and compete against women, even though they have a orthomuscular muscular advantage in competition against women in certain sports, that the female athletes are being slaughtered competitively by biological males who are gender reassigned or who claim to be transsexual. Again, the fake becomes real. And so what's real becomes fake. This is a confused world. And it has the power of law on back of it. That is a major part of the problem. We have a fake school system. In the United States and Great Britain, it's a fake school system particularly the urban public schools. They're fake. They're not there to educate people. They fundamentally fail in their mandate to educate people. As we pointed out, in the inner cities, particularly among minorities, you have people graduating high school with eighth grade reading levels instead of 12th grade reading levels. We have a situation now where books that used to teach children to read, like Dr. Seuss, are being called racist, and this past week, they were calling mathematics racist. How can mathematics be racist? The illusion becomes a delusion. The fake becomes their reality. This whole nonsense in the woke culture, from transgenderism to Dr. Seuss to mathematics being racist, Shakespeare being racist. Now, we know the results of these things. It creates a permanent underclass. And then you have the woke culture. It should be called the sleep culture, the dream culture. I wish people were woke. They would wake up to reality. Um, three out of four Afro-American children, Black American children, being born out of wedlock is not because of white racism. Failed schools in the inner city where... Minority children sent to charter schools do as well as white children, but those educated in the left-wing 
school system with the teachers union is basically a political campaign fund for the left-wing Democratic Party are complete failures, are total failures. They don't want black people to succeed and don't want black children to succeed. Don't read Dr. Seuss. Don't read <laughs> Shakespeare. And now it's even come to mathematics designed to keep blacks out of the high technology. It's designed to keep blacks out of the high paying jobs, yet they'll still vote for the party that does it. The illusion becomes a delusion. No, they're not woke. They're falling asleep to reality. That is what we have happening. Let's go back to the very beginning. I had said many times that the reason America, United States, has worked better than other world powers in history is because it is the most founded on Judeo-Christian principles. That's not to say it is not flawed, it's not made its mistakes, but America never did what ancient Babylon did or what the ancient Egyptians did, or what the Romans did, or it's never done what the European empires did, the French, the British, the, the, the Belgians, the Portuguese, the Spanish. It's, it's never had that kind of history of colonialism to anything like that degree. Some believed in manifest destiny, that America had to democratize the world. Others disagreed and said it was not our place, and it's still an argument today. Nonetheless, even after winning the Second World War, the United States democratized and rebuilt Germany, France, and Italy and turned enemies into democracies like our own, giving those countries a high standard of living. The way you treated blacks, American blacks have a higher standard of living than the blacks in any other country, including black countries, including naturally rich black countries in Africa with high mineral potential. But the money doesn't go to the people. No, they fault America, they fault the West generally, but they won't do it on a comparative scale. And they call this being woke. No, it's going to sleep. They're asleep to the realities. You tell people, they don't want to know. Well, we read in Galatians chapter 5, verse 20, about the deeds of the flesh. Carousing and drunkenness and dissipation and all these things, <clears throat> envy. But one of the deeds of the flesh, which are the opposite of the fruit of the spirit, is party spirit. Party spirit. It's a sin. It's a sin. Most people would be shocked to know. Most people would be shocked to know that the founding fathers of the United States, the signers of the Declaration of Independence, the framers of the Constitution, equated political parties, or they saw political parties as they've evolved to be, as the sin of party spirit entering government <laughs> and pu public governance. They actually saw political parties as the sin of party spirit applied in the realm of government. That's what they saw it as. It's incredible. I'm going to read George Washington in what's known as his, sometimes people call it his um, friends and fellow citizens address sometimes known as his farewell address. It was during his second term as president. Nearly a third of Washington's address is devoted to warning this new country about the dangers of political parties and encouraging his fellow citizens to never allow political parties to gain control of the government. This is George Washington, the founder of the country, the father of the country. It's what he says. I'm quoting him verbatim. Political parties serve to organize faction, 
to give it an artificial and extraordinary force to put in the place of the delegated will of the nation, the will of a party, often a small but artful and enterprising minority of the community. And according to the alternative triumphs of different parties to make the public administration the mirror of ill-concerted and incongruous projects of faction rather than the organ of consistent and wholesome plans digested by common councils and modified by mutual interests. Let me now warn you in the most solemn manner against the baneful effects of the spirit of party. <laughs> he said that an elite would get control of these parties and act against the will of the governed. He warned, he beseeched America not to do it. It serves always to distract the public councils and enfeebles the public administration. In other words, government won't work right. It agitates the community with ill-founded jealousies and with false alarms, said George Washington. It foments occasionally riot and insurrection. <laughs> he didn't even know about Portland, Oregon. It didn't exist yet, but he says that what was going to happen. It opens the door to foreign influence and corruption. What Trump was falsely accused of, Russian collusion, the Biden administration is obviously guilty of. A fire not to quench, it demands a uniform vigilance to prevent its bursting into flames. The very things we'll see happening, it's gonna cause riots and insurrections. You're gonna have an elite that are going to dictate the policies of the party and the party is going to be an instrument to get control of the governed. Instead of the governed controlling the government, the government will control the governed through a political party ruled by elites. That's what George Washington said would happen and he related it to party spirits, which was seen as a moral flaw based on the New Testament. Here's John Adams, the second president. He was from the New England professional and merchant class. He was not a slave owner. He did not agree with the institution of slavery. And his son, John Quincy, was one of the first to oppose it actively in the House of Representatives. He entered the House of Representatives after having been president. There is nothing which I dread so much as the division of the Republic into two great parties, each arranged under its current leader and concerting measures in opposition to each other. This, in my humble apprehension, is to be dreaded as the greatest political evil under our Constitution. John Adams wrote this in 1780. <laughs> he said, if you have this two-party system, a duopoly, now, you had something like that already forming in England. America was to be different than England. They didn't want a government by the elite. In Britain, there was not common suffrage or anything like that until later, until the time of Benjamin Disraeli and so forth. It was basically the nobility, the aristocracy, who controlled the institutions of government in Britain through the House of Lords, through a second unelected House of Parliament, the Lords. That's how they did it. And remnants of that exist even today. Uh, they wanted America to be different. And again, Adams was not a slave owner. Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> he drafted the Declaration of Independence and he said, I never submitted the whole system of my opinions to the creed of any party of men. Whatever in religion and philosophy and politics or in anything else where I was capable of thinking for myself. 
In other words, he's warning about adhering to a party line. Now, adhering to the party line is Zvezhtia. It's Pravda. It's Sovietism. It's Leninism. It's certainly what the Nazis did and Goebbels did. And it's what you see today with the mainstream media, social media. It's what you see with Dorsey. It's what you see with Zuckerberg and Google. It's what you see with CNN and MSNBC and the networks. The same thing that Jefferson is warning about. Such an addiction is the last degradation of a free and moral agent. And what he says is, if I could not go to heaven, but with a political party, I would decline to go. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, 1789. Another of the founding fathers, again, not someone who was a Christian. Jefferson was a deist. Thomas Paine was certainly not a Christian, but he understood biblical principles. Party knows no impulse but spirit. Party spirit. No prize but victory. It is blind to truth and hardened against conviction. It seeks to justify error by perseverance and denies to its own mind the operation of its own judgment. A man under the tyranny of a party is the greatest slave upon the earth. <laughs> For none but himself can deprive him of the freedom of thought. Thomas Paine, 1787. Notice what Thomas Paine is saying. He's saying the tyranny of party spirit. He uses the exact New Testament term, even though he was not a Christian. And he says, it blinds people to the truth and hardens them against conviction. Let's just look at truths no one can deny. For instance, in the United States. Under two terms of Barack Obama, Black American families, on the average, saw their income decline, as I've said a number of times, by $900 after two terms of Obama. They increased by $1,000 the first 11 months of the Trump administration. I'm not making a political statement here. I'm not a Republican. I'm simply stating an objective fact. Barack Obama was the food stamp president, but you had record low unemployment among Black Americans under Donald Trump and persistently high record unemployment among young Blacks under Barack Obama. Income went down for Black families after eight years of Obama, went up almost immediately under Donald Trump. It was Donald Trump who brought the prison reform. The three strikes in your out, Clinton, Harris, certainly Biden, all were for this increasing the Afro-American or the Black American prison population, Trump brought reform. Yet, the mainstream media and the tyranny of party politics says, party spirit knows no impulse but spirit, no prize but victory. It's blind to truth and hardened against conviction. Facts don't matter. Once you have the sin of party spirit entering into the realm of elections and governance, truth won't matter. It'll simply be the party line. The extreme examples of this were, of course, seen in our lifetime in the Soviet Union. Everybody, everybody knew Karl Marx was wrong. Karl Marx was a Darwinist. Karl Marx said a communist uprising of the proletariat could never work in Russia because it was the last of the feudal countries in Europe. It had not evolved enough. It would begin in England and Scotland, the first 
industrial capitalist countries. Communism would begin in the first industrial capitalist countries, Great Britain. It couldn't happen in Russia, said Marx. He was fundamentally wrong. It happened in Russia. It didn't happen in Britain. Everybody knew he was wrong. The Darwinist presuppositions and the Hegelian philosophy underlying his philosophy of history didn't work. But it was still taught in the Soviet school system as if it was scientifically factual. <laughs> because you had a party who said so. The Communist Party said so. It was what is declared by the party is true, not the objective facts. It's unbelievable. Throughout the Islamic world, when you have things like the Ba'ath Party or the Muslim Brotherhood, it's the same thing. Factual reality is immaterial, it doesn't matter. The founding fathers of America understood something that the Puritans, for all their faults, understood in England. Democracy can only work if it's based on the principles of the Judeo-Christian scriptures, otherwise it won't work. And they saw this as the sin of party spirit. They warned about what would happen the early political parties were not parties as we have them now. The Whigs and the Democrats and things like that. They were philosophies, ideologies, not organized political machines. They largely disintegrated after the election. They'd reconfederate or reconfigure for elections, but they were ideologies. Whigs tended to favor a stronger Congress, while the Democrats, so-called, favored a stronger presidency. Things there were ideological differences along these kinds of lines. But they were never political machines. Where you had a political machine, people voted for the machine, not for the ideology. <laughs> the machine supplants the ideology. You look at the Democrats, the left wing of the Democrats and the traditional Democrats, they had to get Biden and Harris because she was black, even though she couldn't get elected to anything on her own, in order to stop Bernie Sanders and the left and the squad and all this stuff. Ideology, there's two rival ideologies. The main thing is we've got to hold the machine together. The Republicans, the same. You have the so-called never-Trumpers. People like the Bush dynasty and, and, and Flake and, 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 and Romney and these kinds of people, Murkowski. Collins, the old Republican Party establishment. Cheney, people like that. And then you have the conservatives and libertarians, people like Ron Paul or people like Donald Trump and so forth. It's a divided party. But the main thing is with people like Mitch McConnell is maintain the machine to fight the opposition. They're more than happy to sacrifice their beliefs, to change their beliefs, to abandon their beliefs. Right now, the Democratic Party believes in states' rights against the federal government. It always has. Only in the 1960s, it was the Dixiecrats, the bull weevils, the Southern segregationist Democrats, the Jim Crow Democrats, who didn't like the federal government saying, you can't keep people out of your schools based on skin color. <laughs> to them, Lincoln was a Republican, and when Eisenhower sent U.S. Marshals to allow a black girl to go to school, that was a violation of states' rights. George Wallace, the Democrat, stood at the 
entry to the university in Alabama wouldn't let black people in when federal federal attorneys came. That was states' rights, said the Democrats. Today, they'll say states' rights. We're not going to cooperate with Homeland Security or with the Border Patrol or with ICE. We're going to allow illegal immigrants to have refuge in our cities and in our states to tax social services, in some cases to add to the crime rate, and certainly in many cases to take jobs away from Hispanic and Black Americans. At one time, Cesar Chavez was a hero to the Democrats. He stood up for the migrant labor in the uh, farming belt in California, in the San Joaquin Valley. But he vehemently opposed illegal immigration at the Mexican border. He had a protest at the Mexican border. No, sweep that under the rug. <laughs> Ideology means nothing to these parties. It's about politics. Democrat, Republican, it's the very, very things that the Founding Fathers warned would happen. And remarkably, they related it to the sin of party spirit in Galatians chapter 5. It's amazing. You root for your team. <laughs> you go with your cause. As long as your cause is what the party wants. If it's not what the party wants, forget about it. Party loyalty supersedes loyalty to your convictions and to your country and its interests. That's what the Founding Fathers said would happen. But George Washington also said it would make you beholden to the interests of foreign governments. <laughs> China Joe Biden, the Saudi Arabian House of Saud had the Bush dynasty and the Bush administration in their back pocket, as I've said repeatedly, even after September 11th. Bush continued to give visas, express visas to Saudi Arabians, even though most of the hijackers were Saudi Arabians and the Saudi Arabian government, essentially members of the royal family, funded what happened. To this day, those 28 pages are being kept from the American public. Uh, the Bush family, the Bush dynasty, had no problem selling America down the river after September 11th. Barack Obama had no problem selling America down the river to Iran. Joe Biden will sell America down the river to Russia, China, or anybody who does a business deal with his son. They just don't care. It's party politics. Hillary Clinton with the uranium, take your pick. It's the very thing George Washington warned would happen. Through the parties, foreign interests, foreign lobby groups would seek to get power and influence to the detriment of the national interest. More people in the United States are independent than are either Democrat or Republican. More people. If you were to look at the original ideology of the United States, its original philosophy of government and economy, you'd have to say that the Democratic Party and the Republican Party should both be abolished and replaced by the Libertarian Party and the Constitution Party. <laughs> they are more authentically American and constitutional. The Democrats and Republicans are in effect, anti-American and anti-constitutional. Many people are naive about this, thinking of 
Republicans as conservative and Democrats as liberal. <laughs> I remember in my youth, the Johnson administration was drafting people to go to an unconstitutional war in Vietnam never declared by Congress. A lot of educated white people were able to get to Canada or to get deferments. Minorities not. They went to Vietnam. Came home in body bags. Nobody cared. This is what the Democrats did. Nixon comes to power. He has detente. He increases trade with Russia and China who are arming the North Vietnamese to kill Americans. Neither party matter. Both parties sold the country down the river. Both parties are what the founding fathers warned about. And conspicuously, the founding fathers warned that this was party spirit, which the New Testament calls a sin. Well, Let's go further with this. What happens when you have this kind of thing? Everything becomes phony. Everything becomes phony. No place did the founders of America who believed in constitutional democracy ever ordain for courts to legislate. Legislating from the bench is completely anti-American in concept. If the Constitution was to be changed, it was to be changed by amendment, putting the power into the hands of the states. Instead, unconstitutionally, unconstitutionally, a Republican Supreme Court just, Chief Justice Roberts writes the decision forcing same-sex marriage to be legally accepted, not with any legislation. Now, the Constitution says where the Constitution is silent, the states decide Constitutionally, the states should have decided, either in their ref in their legislatures or in their refer by public referendum, should we have same-sex unions, same-sex marriage? He ascribes to himself and to the Supreme Court an authority the Constitution did not give him. Barack Obama lights the White House up in the colors of the homosexual rainbow. People don't know that homosexuality is looked down on in the black American community more than it's looked down on among Caucasians. Most Afro-Americans find it Revolting. I've spent much time in Africa. You won't find hardly any, probably none, no homosexuality in tribal Africa. You won't find it. It's something that's inherently antagonistic to the black man's identity, culture, values, and perception of sexuality. Most blacks look down on it. Yet the NAACP pushes it, even though most blacks disagree with it. Under Benjamin Jealous. Notice ideology, conviction, belief mean nothing. It all becomes party politics. That's all. It's all fake. So we have the culture of celebrity. Hollywood, pop music, fashion, and not least of all, internet. 
the culture of celebrity. The founding fathers believed that people elected to Congress or to the White House or to the presidency, the White House didn't exist under George Washington or under John Adams yet. They believed the people elected to government should be people from the real world in trades and professions. They should be farmers, they should be lawyers, they should be physicians, they should be merchants. They should be people from the real world who earn a living in the real world, who have professions and businesses. And we should elect our leaders from among ourselves, that is, real people with real jobs. They never imagined, they never envisioned, they never wanted a professional political class. They had no concept of a professional politician, none. A professional politician is somebody whose profession is getting elected. It's spin doctoring. It's lying to stupid people. It's misleading the public. Once they get elected, it doesn't matter. Look at Harris, just this week, she campaigned against family trusts. <laughs> now we find out her money is in a family trust. <laughs> the mayor of Chicago said we have to close the beauty parlors except for her. She was able to go to the beauty parlor. She's an elitist. Michelle Obama made a speech on the radio about social distancing and what you can't do. The speech was going on on the radio while her husband, Barrick, was on his way to a golf course. These are just like the Politburo, the party elite, the apartheid. They're a professional political class. In Russia, every decision was a political one, not a scientific one, not an economic one. It was a political decision made by the Politburo. Now, there are those determined to bring this to America. America has always had it to a degree, but for it to come into full blossom, you must have socialism. Suspension of free speech. You must have the things the founding fathers warned against political parties that are machines. Well, the culture of celebrity. Just think. We live in a world because of the culture of celebrity where Hollywood film stars, very often Hollywood film stars whose careers are in decline, if you notice that. Very often, it's when their careers are in decline. Not always, but very often. Becoming active as political spokesmen for left-wing, mainly left-wing causes. And the, this messing and these things, and these women on the, that stupid TV show, that what's the, the, the View, yeah, things like this. These are people who really don't know anything. They're not people who know anything. But in the culture of celebrity, people treat them as if they know something. Meryl Streep or LeBron, John, LeBron James, because he's an athlete. Don't save that young black girl's life. 
from that other black girl trying to stab her, LeBron James won't like it. They'll make him their spokesman. The culture of celebrity. The actor Alden Alda played a very good military trauma surgeon, Hawkeye, on the TV series MASH. He played Hawkeye. He was good at playing that role on that TV series. It's considered a classic. Hawkeye, he's a trauma surgeon. Okay, there he is, Alan Alda. If God forbid you got shot, or a member of your family got shot, and remember the murder rates have gone through the ceiling up 25% under democratic governments in the cities run by Democrats. In the last year, it's frightening. What's happened in New York and Chicago is unbelievable. Yet the political machine, people will still vote for the machine, you see. Well, if you were a victim or a member of your family, God forbid, or you, God forbid, or if you were in some kind of traumatic accident, your life was on the line. Who would you want to come at you with a scalpel? Would you want Alan Alda? Hawkeye? Or would you want to get medevac to Cedars of Sinai or UCLA Medical Center or John Hopkins or Massachusetts General? <laughs> you wouldn't want to make believe trauma surgeon? Perhaps the greatest role, probably the greatest role of a lawyer ever played was played by Gregory Peck, who won the Academy Award in To Kill a Mockingbird when he pray, played the defense lawyer, Atticus Finch, defending a falsely accused black man. If you are on trial for a capital crime you did not commit, you were facing the prospect of being executed, who would you want to represent you? F. Lee Bailey, <laughs> a Johnny Cochran, or would you want Gregory Peck? Gregory Peck was a great actor. Alan Alda was a good actor. But they're actors. Gregory Peck was not a trial lawyer. He won the Academy Award for playing Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird. George C. Scott won the Academy Award for playing George Patton, General George Patton. In the Battle of the Bulge, it was his, Hitler's last desperate attempt on the Western Front to stop the Allies from reaching the Rhine, to push them back to the English Channel in a military disaster. Nearly succeeded at one point. The 101st Airborne were completely surrounded. What shall we do, asked Eisenhower. Patton said, I can be there in 48 hours. They said, 48 hours? He said, yes, I've already trained for this. Now, I know he had his defects. But at the Battle of the Bulge, he turned it around. If your country was in strategic trouble, Hitler thought he could get another Dunkirk, this time with the Americans as well as the British. If you were surrounded like the 101st Airborne were, the Nazis were fighting desperately for their survival, would stop at nothing. Who would you want to be in command? George Patton or George C. Scott? Well, obviously, you'd want Patton. 
obviously you'd want F. Lee Bailey. Obviously, you'd want a real trauma surgeon. You want Dr. Ben Carson or something, if it was a brain or something. That's what you'd want. But in the culture of celebrity where we have party politics, in a very real sense, based on the sin of party spirit, People are voting, turning to solutions, even in desperate circumstances, to actors. The actors of which I speak are not the thespians. They're not the actors of Hollywood. They're the other kinds of actors, the other kinds of people who are paid to pretend they are something they are not. <clears throat> professional politicians. Now it's become so stupid that people will actually look to actors for political leadership. They'll actually do that. Republicans have been as guilty as the Democrats. When Ronald Reagan was governor of California, he tripled the state income tax. He set the stage for what would have been known later as the tax revolt. That was Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan created the tax debacle in California. As president, his deficits were the highest in history up to that point. He looted Social Security. He built aircraft carriers and paid for them with a credit card. And his regime was, his government, his administration was, 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 was very corrupt. They sold weapons to Iran, the terrorist Iran and lied about it. His wife was going to fortune tellers and astrologers and giving him advice as his mind began to become nimble. He would actually say things like, trees cause 85% of all pollution. His wife would stand on back of him. She was going to fortune tellers. She had Gene Dixon, a clairvoyant, ESP people. Now the scriptures tell us this is witchcraft. It's demonic. Everybody in his administration Meese and Poindexter, these guys are all McFarland. They were all indicted. When Bush came into power, he gave presidential pardons to Weinberger and these guys who were caught in the scandals that surrounded Reagan. But you see, because of the culture of celebrity and because of the matter that people still think Reagan was fantastic. <laughs> Supplied weapons to terrorist Iran after they grabbed the American hostages. Guns for hostages and then lied. Guns for hostages and lied. The whole thing with Oliver North. Openly corrupt administration. Oh, he was a great Christian. What kind of a Christian is taking advice from a wife who's going to fortune tellers and astrologers? Even as the Iron Curtain began to collapse, he was doing things like guaranteeing the interest on the communist government's debt in Poland. Look, I, he promised Christian America he was pro-life only to appoint Sandra Day O'Connor to the Supreme Court, a pro-abortion judge who he knew was pro-abortion. She wrote the decision ordering the Ten Commandments out of the judicial building in Alabama. This is the legacy of Ronald Reagan. 
That other judge, Vaughn Walker, appointed by Bush, who outlawed Proposition 8 in California, Reagan nominated him to the bench. But you see, the party politics and the culture of celebrity blind people to the reality. What you've got is a grade B Hollywood actor who co-starred to a chimpanzee hired by the Republican Party establishment to play the role of a conservative. Then under Gray Davies, the economy of California gets in real trouble. Reagan raised the taxes so high there was a tax revolt, and then there was massive deficits. What do we do? Kvick called the Terminator. They literally voted for the Terminator. They think that the Terminator could have saved the economy of California. That is how ridiculous it is. That is how fake it is. Illusion becomes delusion. Reality becomes fake, and the fake becomes the reality. They can't tell the difference between the silver screen and the hardcore facts. Barack Obama. Not a smart black like Dr. Thomas Sowell. Not a smart black like Professor Walter Williams, brilliant economist. Not a brilliant brain surgeon like Dr. Ben Carson or a rocket scientist turned successful businessman like Herman Cain. He's not a smart black. In fact, he's culturally white. He grew up white, but he knew how to play the race card. But he's not a smart black. He's not a Ben Carson or a Thomas Sowell. He's, he, he's not a clever black businessman like Barry Gordy or, or, or Herman Cain. He, he, he had no real ability in the real world. He was a community organizer. <laughs> Knew nothing about business, nothing about economics, nothing about foreign policy and defense. He knew nothing. Nothing. He was a professional politician. People voted for him. Liberals voted for him because he was black, they thought. Blacks voted for him because he was black. Three kinds of people who voted for him were the three kinds he knifed in the back. Students, blacks, and Jews. Being an enemy of Israel. Be that as it may, people believed him. Mainstream media, culture of celebrity, party politics. That's all it becomes. Party spirit. Arnold Schwarzenegger and Barack Obama were no more equipped to be a governor and a president than Alan Alda would be to perform brain surgery or than Gregory Peck would be to defend a client on trial for his life or than George C. Scott would to command the 8th U.S. Army at the Battle of the Bulge. No more qualified. But the fake becomes the reality, this is bad. This is what the Founding Fathers warned against. And this is what we've got. I find it remarkable 
that they understood on back of party politics there's a party spirit. That's how astute people were to scripture at that time compared to now. Now even many Christians don't understand these things, but let's move on. Again, the founding fathers wanted people from the real world. You have some. Alan Dershowitz said that Ted Cruz was the most brilliant law student he ever taught. And Mr. Dershowitz is a Democrat, not a Republican. Mr. Cruz is a conservative. Mr. Dershowitz would identify himself as a liberal, howbeit a sane libertarian type liberal. Ron Paul is an eye surgeon. Donald Trump was a property developer. These were people or are people from the real world with real jobs. They're not actors and they're not professional politicians. An actor is somebody who's paid to pretend to be something he's not. A professional politician is somebody who's paid to pretend to be something he's not. Only he convinces people he is <laughs> or she is. But if an actor can do that, <laughs> why not a professional politician? Well, that's the world we live in. That's the America we live in. But now let's talk about something much more serious and important. No, the Constitution and its framers never envisioned political parties. They warned against it. The New Testament, its authors inspired by the Holy Spirit warned about party spirit. They didn't envision political parties either, which we call denominations. Find me one. Find me one. Look at what's become of these movements. They become run on the basis of politics. The Southern Baptist Convention. You have somebody like Greer, J.D. Greer, Baptist, born-again believers who are Baptists need to become the number one spokesman for homosexual and lesbian rights. This is the Baptist Convention. Most Baptists don't believe that, but the party elite believes it. <laughs> I have warned in the past that the only thing these denominations become eventually are tax deductible property trusts and superannuation funds for the retirement of ministers with a cross on the roof. They run on the basis of financial interest and of theocratic political interest. It's politics. The World Council of Churches, it's politics. The Vatican has always been politics. The minute Chuck Smith checked out and went to be with the Lord, what became of Calvary Chapel? It's all politics. Oh, the founding fathers may not have believed it. That's not what Chuck Smith wanted for Calvary Chapel. It's not what John Wesley wanted for the Methodists. I'll grant you that. It's not what John Bunyan or, or, or William Carey wanted for the Baptists. I'll grant you that.
But that's what it's become. The fact that most people don't agree with it, but they still go along with it. There are things being done by the Biden administration that most Democrats don't agree with. Most Democrats do not want an unenforced border policy. Most Democrats, most, want voter ID laws. But the party elite doesn't. Well, most Baptists do not want to sanction same-sex marriages. But the theocratic elite does. The party elite does. No, the founders of the Baptist, the Methodist, Calvary Chapel, or any other mainstream denomination never wanted or envisioned what's become of those denominations. They too were run by party spirit. But it's no different in principle or in praxis than what Thomas Paine, George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson and others warned would happen to American democracy because of this sin of party spirit. That's what's happened. That's exactly what's happened. Notice that the social and political ills that we face, the institutional corruption of our governments, our courts in America, Britain, Australia, the institutional corruption comes about because of a departure from scriptural principles. But how can that not happen? When the corruption and debauchery in the church, counterfeit revivals, new apostolic reformation, word faith money preachers, ecumenism, Those things are forced down the throat of Christians by machines. If it's happening in the church, how can it not happen in government, in secular society? The church runs on a culture of celebrity. The same as you have professional politicians who are not equipped, not qualified to be presidents or members of Congress. Alejandra Ortega Cortez was a bartender. She doesn't know what she's talking about most of the time. Well, either does Beth Moore. Either does Paula White. You've got proven false prophets like Pat Robertson who have serially predicted things in the name of the Lord that failed to happen and he's still in leadership. That's what George Washington said would happen in government. Nobody would be held accountable for their mistakes if you had party spirit. If you had parties, that's exactly what he said. There would be no accountability. That's what he believed. And he was right. He was exactly right. It serves always to distract the public councils and enfeebles the public administration. It agitates the community with ill-founded jealousies and false alarms. But then he goes on to say, the 
that it foments occasionality, riot, and insurrection, opens the door to foreign influence and corruption, a fire not quenched, it demands a uniform vigilance to, to prevent it from burning into flames. Under it, there's no accountability. No accountability. People can do things and it won't matter. It's the party. Isn't it horrible that Barack Obama lied 31 times on national television? Lied 31 times to the American people that you can keep your existing health insurance if you want it. Lied 31 times. In Arizona, the cost went up 117%. Most states, the cost of health insurance went up 60%. In no state did it go up less than 40% under Barack Obama, who lied, lied, and lied again. Does his party hold him accountable? No, he's pulling the strings now. They're still lying. Well, okay. What about the false prophecies of Kenneth Copeland, of Benny Hinn, of Cindy Jacobs, of Pat Robertson? Does the church hold them accountable? Nope. The church is called to be salt and light. If the salt loses its taste, it's good for nothing but to be trampled underground. I'm disgusted, as are many thinking people, and certainly many thinking Christians, about what has happened to the United States, Great Britain, Australia, certainly Canada, and how quickly it's happened. I'm appalled by what's happening in countries like Finland, Holland, Sweden, Protestant democracies, appalled, maybe even shocked, perhaps I shouldn't be, but my sentiments are widely held by many believers. We see what's happening. What right do I have, however, as a Christian to be shocked about what's happening in Washington and in Whitehall and in Canberra when it's happening in the World Council of Churches, when it's happening in the Southern Baptist Convention, when it's happening in our own churches and denominations, The Founding Fathers understood what the repercussions of party spirit would be. And the Founders of Christianity understood what the repercussions of party spirit would be. That's the reality. This is where we find ourselves. If this is the church, what do we expect from the world? If these are the kind of leaders we have within the so-called body of Christ, what do you expect from politicians? It's sad, isn't it? It's a very sad reality. Oh, we can pray and we should. But things have gone so far. Is there any respite? Dear friends, the culture of celebrities in the church, just watch people like Stephen Furtick 
Andy Stanley, Michael Brown. Just watch these people and their shameful antics. Professional politicians, professional performers. That's what we're left with. That's all we're left with. That's what we've got in the government. That's what we've got in the church. But there will be those who see through it. There will be those who will understand what has happened. There will be those who understand what is happening. And there will be those who will understand by the grace and wisdom of God what is going to happen. Our hope, our ambition of all of us at Moriel is that we and you, by the mercies of God, be among those who do understand. Jesus is coming soon, praise God. That is the light at the end of an ever-darkening tunnel. God bless and thank you for listening.